Hi, my name is Joe Audet, and today I want to show a little demo on using the CloudScribe project template for Visual Studio. So I'm going to click the File New Project, and I'm assuming you've already installed this. It's in the Visual Studio Gallery. I'm just going to choose a folder where I want to create my file, and for my purposes, I'm just going to put it into this demo folder. And what should we call it? Acme.webapp and I'm going to choose the CloudScribe web application and I'm going to let it create a directory for the solution and click OK and the next thing you get is a dialog window where you can choose the various CloudScribe options. For this demo I'm just going to use NoDB which is no database it just stores files on disk you can see we've got support for SQL Server, MySQL and PostgreSQL as well and I'm going to accept the default settings. I'm going to have pages for my home uh, root uh, route, and I'm going to have a blog. Uh, there's a few other options. You know, if you wanted the blog at the root of your site, you can do that. If you just want to use uh, the blog only, you can do that. You can have a home controller for your root instead if you want to do that. Or you can just leave out simple content feature and just use CloudScribe Core if you want to do that. I'm going to include logging, which uh, just gives us a logging to the data storage with a UI for browsing the log. I'm going to go ahead, <coughs> go ahead and include the contact form. That's just a little extra simple standalone feature. I'm going to leave out these other things for now. Maybe I'll do another demo to show those things later. But you can do custom registration fields very easily with uh, configuration. And you can have identity server integration if you want to um, be able to authenticate using JWT tokens for like a SPA single page application style app. app. But I am going to include these items here in the expert zone. I do want to mention that these require additional tooling and you should probably click this link and visit cloudscribe.com to learn about that. You've, you've got to have Node.js and NPM installed. Um, there is a version of Node that ships with Visual Studio, but it's an old version and it doesn't work with SAS, which is one of the things that I'm using in this template when you include this. So you have to install Node and you have to uh, configure Visual Studio to use your newer version of Node. Um, I've got instructions about that on the website. But for this purpose, I'm going to go ahead and include that. I'm going to click OK. It's going to create my project. And it opens up a README when the project is done, telling you next steps. It tells you like the login credentials by default are going to be admin at admin.com and the password admin. Once you run the site or especially before or after you deploy it, you should definitely change those credentials. Um, it mentions some other things and links to other things. I'll leave this for you to review later on. I'm just going to go ahead and close that for now. The project has been created, so I'm back in Visual Studio. We can take a look here and we'll see the files. Um, and as I mentioned, this in this one I included the um, Webpack setup. So under dependencies we have both NuGet and NPM and you can see that's yellowed out here. When I build the solution it should automatically restore those, but you can also right click that and choose restore packages if you want to if you have trouble if it doesn't work automatically you can also do it from the command line using npm install but let's just try rebuilding for now so rebuilding is going to make it restore the NuGet packages and hopefully the npm packages but if it doesn't we can always do that manually And it looks like it's working. It's doing its first Webpack build. And it created the bundles. So yeah, it looks like everything worked good. So now the, the project is built. Everything's good. I'm just going to say um, View in Browser. And I'm going to just use Google Chrome. For some reason, it doesn't show the View in Browser until the second time you click it or browse with the Browse with button. And so Chrome is what I'm going to use. It's going to open up the site. Okay, so there we have it. The site is running. There's no pages have been created with simple content yet, so it's got a little placeholder here telling us about that. You can see the login button. I'm going to go ahead and log in. As I mentioned, the default credentials are going to be 
admin at admin.com and the password admin. So I'm just going to log in and the browser wants to prompt me to save my password which I'm not going to do. And now that I'm logged in you notice the message changed saying that there's no pages found. Click the pencil to create the home page. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to say welcome home. And while I'm here, I might as well show you a, a cool feature of Simple Content is that you can drag and drop images into the editor. So I'm going to grab an image here. Let's see. Something colorful. How about this one? And you can see it just went right in there and that actually uploaded in the background and it resized that image according to some configuration choices that you can change if you, how, it, how it does the resizing. I'm going to save my page and you'll notice that not only did it upload and resize it but the, uh, the web size links to the full version size so you can actually still have the high quality one there. Okay so the, the home page is created. Um, next thing I want to do is just kind of show you around the menu. Most of what you see here comes from CloudScribe Core. There's only two menu items that come from CloudScribe Simple Content. That's the content settings and the page management, which we'll get back to later. Um, you can see there's a site list and a new site. There's a support for creating multiple sites in one installation. Um, you don't have to use that if you don't want to, and you can remove those items from the menu easily if you don't want them there. Uh, let's take a look in site settings. In site settings, you'll see that we can choose our theme, and currently it's set to custom one. Custom one is uh, part of that extra checkbox with the webpack. I've included a, an extra theme that's all ready to be customized using SAS with Bootstrap, which SAS makes it very easy to change colors and all the parameters of Bootstrap. It, SAS is like CSS with variables and mixins and other cool things to make it easy to customize. But I wanted to note that we have a bunch of Bootswatch themes already included too. Um, so you can try those and just click save and preview and the whole look will change. Um, so there's a lot of different ones there. I'm going to go ahead and change it back to custom one because I want to show you how you can do that. Okay. Before I go further though, I want to go back to Visual Studio and kind of give you a little tour of the files that we have here. First we have App Settings, and if you open that up, you'll see some things in here. We chose that contact form. In order for that to work, in fact, if you go to that contact form, it'll say, sorry, it's not configured yet. Well, to get that working, you have to put in some SMTP settings, and you also have to put an email address to receive the notification when someone submits the form. It can actually be a comma separated list if you want multiple recipients. But once you set those settings up, uh, then that contact form will be enabled. We've got it disabled by default because you don't want someone to submit a form that doesn't do anything and you don't know about it. So it's better to just show that it's not configured at this point. You can set recapture keys here you, and you can also set SMTP settings in the administration menu here. And if you put them here, CloudScribe Core will use those in preference to the ones in the config file. But the contact form currently only, only uses the ones from the config file, so you should probably put them there. And if you want to just use them from there, you can also remove this menu item very easily, as I'll show you. Okay, so we also have appsettings.development.json and that one can be used to override any settings from the main app settings file when the environment is development. And you can also create one manually on your production server called appsettings.production.json. Now the way I usually do it is if I'm using a database I will not have my database connection string in the app settings file. I'll put it in the appsettings.development file and then I'll have a different connection string in my production one on the production server when I deploy. And then I will git ignore that file so that those credentials don't go into my source control. That's assuming you're using git for your source control. Um, so 
just be aware that you can override settings. Any, anything in this file is going to override what's in the main app settings file when the environment is development, which it is by default when we're running in Visual Studio. Um, okay, so some of the other files in here that I want to point out, uh, we've got a whole, those shared themes that we saw on the drop-down list, they're here, they're just uh, layout files and dub dub root files, and then for private themes per site, those go under the site files folder, and then we have a little alias of the site ID, instead of using a GUID, um, we alias it with the incremental counting just to keep a short folder name. So the themes listed here are only available to site to the first site. If you create other sites, those themes won't be there, but the shared themes will be there. And you'll see that I put the custom one here, and in there we have a layout file. And that layout file and the CSS is the main thing you're going to customize for your theme. And you'll note that we're pointing to dist mainstyle.bundle.cs and dist mainstyle.bundle.min.css. And then at the bottom we've got JavaScript and we've got the dist boot.bundle, which is the bootstrap, bootstrap JavaScript. And then we've got the minified version of that as well for production environment. So you'll want to customize the layout file and you'll want to customize the style. Now, the style is coming from that dist folder, and that is under wwroot dist. And those files are generated by Webpack from our source files. So generally, since this everything in this folder is generated, I usually git ignore this folder uh, and just let it not go into source control, because you just generate it every time you run it. It will be included when you publish, which you do want. And so right now you can see that we've only got the non-minified versions here. Um, I want to talk about how that Webpack stuff all works. Okay, so it starts with the fact that we're using NPM, and we've got this package.json file that has all of our client-side dependencies. And you can see I've got these organized a little bit. Uh, I would have made them all alphabetical normally, but I kind of grouped them these are sort of the main ones that I needed just to get TypeScript working and Webpack and everything. These were added for React and these were added for Redux with React. So if you don't need that stuff you could remove those and of course if you're using other client-side dependencies you can add them to this package.json file. Now You notice at the bottom there's a script section and we've got defined commands build which runs Webpack and build production which runs webpack but passes in a config pointing to our production webpack file. So this one is just going to run the, the main webpack file is webpack.config and then there's the production version which is what's going to minify the files. Let's take a quick look in webpack. So the main thing is that each of these entries corresponds to a bundle that will be created. And these are just samples. This is part of the React sample that I included. This is the TypeScript Hello World sample. This is uh, Bootstrap JavaScript. Um, and using the individual components, you can include or leave out bits of Bootstrap that you're not using. And, and you can do the same thing with the style. So this is coming from our Bootstrap S, Bootstrap SAS. And I'm also using a uh, Visual Studio extension called uh, NPM Task Runner that integrates NPM with the built-in Task Runner Explorer in Visual Studio. And you can see uh, I also have it where when we built the solution it actually generated those bundles. Now how it did that is actually because of the csproj file which we can take a look at. The csproj file has all your server-side dependencies, but it also has some things set up for TypeScript, um, files to exclude when publishing, defined here at the top. But down here at the bottom, you'll see these target for, for uh, running Webpack when you build. And then there's another one that when you publish, it's going to do the production version, which is going to minify the files and even create gzip pre-gzipped files of the JavaScript and CSS. 
which is pretty cool. And we also have what's known as hot module reloading, and that's used. Um, Webpack has a hot module reloading thing, and this ASP.NET Core SPA Services Webpack package ha allows you to integrate that with uh, ASP.NET Core. And you'll see down in the configure that if the environment is development, we're using Webpack middleware with the hot model module replacement. And because we have the React sample 2, we also have the React hot module replacement. That's only for development time. At production, the already bundled files are used. But what this hot module reloading allows us to do is to see our changes immediately um, just by refreshing the page without having to rerun that task manually or anything like that. So basically, in the background, it's going to run that task for you whenever you edit a file. So let's take a look at that. Let's talk about how to customize that theme. Now, notice that these app folders, these are the client-side uh, apps. And the app.scss is where we're, our style files are for, for SAS. And the main one is style.scss. you notice the other ones are using the convention of an underscore. That's typically how you indicate that that file doesn't actually get bundled. It's included in this main style bundle. The style imports those files, and then you can put additional CSS right in right in this file or SCSS. You can use parameters, but using Bootstrap SAS, we've got the variable files, and then we've got the main Bootstrap file. So the way this works is if you don't want some parts of Bootstrap, you can just leave those out and make the amount of CSS that you're bundling smaller. Um, so, you know, you figure out at the end. So, in this case, I've actually commented out the glyph icons because with this template, I set it up to use Font Awesome icons instead. And that's why I also have a Font Awesome.scss file. Now, this is not a um, all inclusive Font Awesome here. I've included a subset of Font Awesome, and you could prune it out even smaller, um, or you can add icons that I left out if you need them. I'm just trying to show strategies of reducing the overall size of the of the final CSS. Um, so you just want what you're using. And there are tools like CSS Lint that could be useful in kind of helping you prune out the amount of CSS that you're e bundling. But for our purposes, I want to just do a quick demo in variables.scss, and this is where we override the bootstrap variables. So I know already that the top nav bar in our site up here is coming from, um, it's using the nav bar inverse. So I'm going to look for that, the background color of the nav bar inverse, and that's right here. Navbar inverse dash BG is the background color. And I'm just going to use the color picker here, and I'm going to choose like a dark blue or something like that. And I'm just going to save the file. I'm going to go back and I'm going to refresh the page. And there you see, instantly it changed without me having to rebundle or regenerate my bundle. That's that's the hot module reloading. So the next thing I want to do is show you the little sample apps that were included, because they're not automatically in the site. We've got the sample uh, React app, and we've got the sample TypeScript app. And so app-react, app -react, that's a little sample that came from actually the Microsoft SPA template sample for React and Redux. And then app vanilla is just uh, kind of a vanilla TypeScript. It's just a little hello world app. And then app vendor is where I've got the bootstrap JavaScript. And again, in there, you can comment out or include just the bits of bootstrap JavaScript that you're using. So I'm not currently using the carousel. If you need that, you can put it back. Um, you know, I just commented out some things that I wasn't using. And that's an, a way to reduce the 
total size of the JavaScript that's loaded in the page, just to what we need. Bootstrap comes with a lot of things, and you might not be using all of them, and if you're not using them, you can make the file smaller. So let's go back to the browser, and let's talk about how we can use those client apps. Um, you know, if you weren't using simple content like we are here, you could just put the markup and the script into a view, but CloudScribe Simple Content actually lets us do, do that right in a page. So I can just create a new page, and the first page I'm going to create, I'm just going to call it Client Apps. It's going to be like a parent page. I'm not really going to have any content, so I'm just going to show a child menu. And then below that page, I'll create a new page, and I'll call it Vanilla TypeScript. And because I'm going to put a spa style app with just a little empty div here, this is a CK editor. CK editor doesn't really like to let you put in an empty div. So we have a setting to just disable that because normally for a spa style app, that's all you have is a little empty div with an ID and then the JavaScript will load the app into that. And so now that I've created that page and made that setting, I go back in to edit it. And now there's no editor here, it's just a plain text area. And I'm just going to create a div with an ID equals greeter. It's just an empty div, and, it, and that's why I disabled the editor. CK editor doesn't like to let you do that kind of thing. And then I'm going to save that again. And then I'm going to go back in. And now we've got this developer tool button here too, and that's where I can add JavaScript and CSS if needed. In this case, I'm just going to add JavaScript. Now remember that for development, we use the unminified version. I would usually, you know, increment this to like three. You can't edit this once you create it, but you can just delete it and add it back if you need to change the sort. It doesn't really matter. In this case, we're just adding one file. It's going to be uh, this dist vanilla bundle, and it's only going to be there during, in development environment. And then I'm going to add one for production that's just going to be the same thing, but the, the minified version, which we haven't, <clears throat> we haven't created that yet because we haven't published and we haven't manually run that task, but I can show you how to do that. But now I've added that to the page. I can just click the cancel button, which it doesn't really cancel. It just takes me back to the page. And there we have it. Hello world from TypeScript. Now, how did that TypeScript app work? Let's look at that code and you can see it's just looking for an element named with ID of greeter, and it's got a little hello world message that it's putting into its inner HTML. And I can just update that message and say with CloudScribe and save it. And I can refresh the page. And there we have it, hot module reloading. Kind of cool. So that's a pretty, you know, not a very impressive app. Uh, let's go ahead and set up the little React app too. So we'll create another page and we'll say React app. And again, I'm going to disable the HTML editor so that I can just manually put in the markup I want. I have to edit that again. And this one, we have a div ID equals React dash app. And what I've seen is that you can just put like a loading indicator here, and that would be shown until it actually loads. And I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to add the scripts. And that's done with the developer tools. And again, for development purposes, I'm going to add the React bundle. And for production, I'm going to add the minified version of that. And again, if I was going to have multiple scripts on the page, you could control the sort order. But you can't edit that after you create it. So you should think ahead of what you want your sort to be. Or then you can just delete it and then recreate it to change the sort. So there we've got the bundled, the minified version for production and the unminified version for uh, development. And again, I'm just going to go back to the page, which I could just do that from here. And boom, there's our Hello World React app. And it's got navigation 
you can see you click the counter and you can even see the URL up here changed but we didn't really you know reload the page this is all client side it's got this little fake weather forecast um, because it's using Redux it's actually stateful where you can increment that and go away from it and come back and it's still there um, so that's a little sample react app um, and we have a sample TypeScript app and now uh, I want to just take another quick peek back in the menu to show you that page manager all the pages in simple content can be arranged here so if I wanted to change the menu order here I could just move that page now you won't see the change in the menu here until you reload the page but now I've moved the react app to the top and the vanilla TypeScript to the bottom of that sub menu and you can get to the page edit features and you can resort pages alphabetically if you wanted to um, it's just basically a drag and drop arrangement of your hierarchy which once you get a lot of pages that can be very helpful now we've also got the content settings here where you can uh, you know if you by default we're including the blog in the menu if you're not using the blog you could disable it here there's actually a few different ways you can add the blog to the menu um, this way kind of gives you control to put it in the top top of the site but it's not uh, it's not as flexible you can also leave it out of the menu here and then just create a simple content page with an override or that po points to the blog and then you can move it around with any of the pages managed by simple content and speaking of that speaking of the menu let's talk about how that works in the solution if we look there's the navigation.xml file and in there you'll see that the home controller has a tree builder defined on it and that's the simple content tree builder so that's how the the pages are managed by simple content that come from data storage or added dynamically to the menu by using this sub tree builder on the home node all these other nodes are just kind of manual nodes that point to controllers and actions like the contact page feature that's a separate feature now if you wanted to manage the contact page within that page manager you could just remove this and add it back to the menu as a simple content page um, and that's just done with an override URL if you create a page in simple content and you specify an override URL then you're not really using simple content you're just saying add a menu item with this override URL so you'll get you know the title will be in the menu and the URL can be whatever it wants so you could just put you know slash contact and you could override this page to point to the contact page and then you wouldn't need it in the navigation.xml so it's just a matter of how you you know maybe that you're satisfied with the page being right there in the menu but you've got flexibility to let simple content manage menu items that aren't simple content pages now all the other stuff under here are all the administrative features of CloudScribe core and simple content and if you create your own controllers and your own custom features you can add those right in here to get them into the menu and you can the menu is filtered by roles so you know the administrative features are not shown unless you're logged in with an administrator role um, so that's how the menu gets built it all starts with this XML file as sort of the root of the tree and then from there it can also have nested tree builders and we've got a tree builder and simple content that we embed by this declaration here and that allows it to uh, create its own pages and make it make its own page the home page okay just in taking another quick look around to show you what else is in the menu there's a company info section which you, you site settings is exposed in the layout so you could actually populate this and then use it in your layout file like say to put your company address and name in the footer of the layout file um, again you need email SMTP settings here uh, or in the config file and that would be used by CloudScribe core for like password reset emails or account approval uh, verifying an email address if you require that which we should talk about that I guess under the security settings you can require a uh, in fact there's an option not shown here until you until can uh, SMTP settings are configured you can't require a confirmed email since there's no way to 
send an email. But as soon as you set up SMTP, a new checkbox appears here that says, you know, require a verified email. And then if someone registers on your site, an email will get sent to their email address and they have to click a link to prove that that's their email. And that's a good thing. And you can also require approval before login and then you can put email address of who you want to notify who can approve an account. And then we've got um, CAPTCHA settings. If you put in reCAPTCHA keys here, you can have automatically uh, CAPTCHA on the login and registration page. You can use the invisible reCAPTCHA, which I recommend. Um, social logins, you can configure all the client, um, all your app, app IDs and app secrets here. And as soon as you do that, that will show up on the login and registration page where people can just use their uh, existing account to log in without having to remember a new password. Um, you've got on the login page, you can show additional information at the top and at the bottom if you want to provide additional instructions on the login page. On the register page, you can have information at the top. I call that the preamble. And then you can have an agreement. And if you populate this, then they have to check a box that says they agree to terms when they register. And then if you edit it later and you keep this checked when you save it, then the next time they come back to the site, they would have to accept it again. Um, then we've got the user management section. Under here, you can create users. You can manage users that are registered. You can approve users if, if they require approval. If you click the Manage button of an existing user, you can uh, see their information. And you can see that down here, you can add custom claims for a user. And then you can also manage roles for a user. So here we show the roles. You can create new roles. Um, users automatically get, get added to this authenticated users role, which uh, just is an easy way to set, show or hide content whether a user's signed in or not. Um, we've got a few other built-in roles. I'll click one that's empty. If you're an administrator, you don't need to be in these other roles. You, you can do everything, so you don't need to be in lots of roles. Um, but a content administrator could, could manage the content but not manage users. Uh, role administrators can manage roles but not users. These things are configurable, actually, from the policies in the startup.cs. And you'll see down here, configure auth policy. We're just using the um, default policies, but you could comment those out and override them here if you wanted to. You could look at what these do in the CloudScribe source code, and you could copy that code here if you wanted to, but they're pretty sensible. Uh, there's, um, there's also a file manager policy, so you can control who, who can uh, upload files or delete files. And if you build custom features, you can protect them with your own auth authorization policies. And policies can be based on roles, or they can be based on claims, or they can be based on custom rules that you write. Um, but with CloudScribe Core, it's sort of easy to just use roles or claims, since we already provide a way to manage that on the user. So you define the policy, and then you grant the user the roles or claims needed to meet the policy to give them permission. So when you want to add users to a role, you just click the roles, and then you click Add User, and you will get a modal dialog that shows users who are not currently in the role, and you can add them to the role. Now, as mentioned, if you're an administrator, you don't really need to be in other roles, so I don't need to add anybody, but just showing you how that works. Um, we also have built-in country and state information. That's used in the company info drop-down here, if you can if you select United States, then the state drop-down will get populated with the U.S. states. Um, and that data comes from, from the core data. Now, this is not uh, a comprehensive set of data. I don't promise that it has every country. It certainly doesn't have every state. But it is editable, so if you need more data, you can put in new countries and new states. Um, then we've also got the system information and that just tells you about you know the versions of CloudScribe components and that kind of thing and then we also have 
the system log and that's that login feature I mentioned that allows you to browse the log and you can clear the log and you know for development we're doing pretty active logging so even though I cleared it we're back to some we immediately get more log items just from this request so oh, I don't know how I got logged out there something happened so that's pretty much the quick tour of CloudScribe core and CloudScribe simple content um, I didn't mention you know the blog it works a lot like the pages you create a new page with the plus you you edit an existing page with a pencil pretty much just like the CMS the uh, tree icon goes for managing the page hierarchy there's no page hierarchy with blog so you just have these two for blog but it works the same way you can drag and drop images uh, it works like you expect the blog to work so that's it I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and you can see how easy it is to jump start web projects using CloudScribe and especially when you want to do custom bootstrap themes uh, this is a really good setup with the webpack it does require additional tooling I hope you'll also visit cloudscribe.com we've got a lot of documentation there um, so be sure and check out our documentation section we're adding to it all the time um, and you know when people ask me questions it, it helps me realize what what's missing in the documentation so you can also ask questions uh, we have a, a Gitter chat room uh, I'm not sure if I have that linked on the site I have it in the github repos we have links to the Gitter chat web page and that's an easy place to ask uh, just kinda casual questions you can also post issues in the github repository you can ask questions on Stack Overflow uh, using the CloudScribe tag. So hope you'll give it a try. I think you'll find it very useful in your projects. And thanks for watching.